Hi and welcome to Cyber Reason's Malicious Life. I'm Ran Levy. You've probably noticed that smart homes are slowly but surely becoming a part of our everyday lives. Many of us already own a smart TV that can stream YouTube or Netflix, smart speakers such as Amazon's Echo or Google Home, or security cameras that we can access remotely from our phones. Some early adapters even have remotely controlled alarm systems, water heaters and refrigerators. And it's a trend that's likely to keep growing year by year. All these smart devices are connected to the internet, and so it's little wonder that they are at risk of getting hacked. Still, it can be enlightening to get a glimpse of the numbers that serve to quantify that risk. In July 2021, researchers working for the British consumer magazine Witch built their own smart home made up of a variety of real consumer devices. Gadgets that anyone can buy. Smart audio systems, a smart thermostat, a smart kettle, and so on. They connected everything to the internet and immediately experienced a relentless sequence of attacks aimed at the entire system and at specific gadgets in it. More than 2,000 malicious login attempts using the default usernames and passwords that devices leave the factory with in just a single week. That's roughly 14 attacks per hour. Most of the attacks were intercepted. The magazine's employees were helped by security experts from NCC Group and the Global Cyber Alliance, so they definitely had a certain advantage over the hackers. Still, some of the hacks were successful. For instance, a wireless camera purchased on Amazon was hacked and someone used it to spy on the house. So, here's a question for you. What is the most vulnerable device in a smart home? Let's see if you guessed it right. According to a study by Avira, a security software company, two such devices sit at the top of the list. The first, smart speakers. It's no secret that smart speakers, such as the Amazon Echo or Google Home, have security risks. Researchers from Checkpoint, for example, have shown how easy it is to hack into Alexa, the brains behind Amazon's home speakers. A malicious link sent to users led to personal information leaking from the device, including, among other things, details about users' bank accounts. Basically, it's the same kind of information that can be found on a PC or a smartphone, devices that we put a lot more effort into protecting. In 2017, Chinese scientists demonstrated how they can use high-frequency sound waves, sounds that are too high-pitched for human ears, yet can be picked up by a device's microphones, to take over smart speakers from 16 different vendors, including Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, and others. Having attackers gaining access to the personal information stored within these smart speakers is bad enough, but the biggest security problem with smart speakers is the fact that they can and do serve as a portal to other devices. A smart speaker can allow you to do many things in the house, from turning the lights on and off to operating the smart locks on the front door. Gaining control over a smart speaker can potentially give an attacker access to many other smart devices in our homes, creating all new kinds of risks. But there's another more surprising star on the top of the list for the most vulnerable devices in our smart home. It's not a device that we usually think about as dangerous. It looks friendly. It's big, it just sits there, we stare at it for hours, and we never feel that it's following us in any way. I'm talking about your TV. Not every TV, of course. Old TV sets that don't have network access and don't use apps are about as dangerous as a flower pot. That is, you can definitely get hurt by them, 
if they fall on your head. But smart TVs, as it turns out, are probably the weakest security link in our smart homes. First, let's define what makes a TV a smart TV. Simply put, any device that can be connected to the internet is a smart TV. Once the connection is on, you can stream various media services on it, run applications similar to our smartphone apps, browse the internet, play games, and more. Essentially, we're talking about a PC, but one which is operated a little differently and with a bigger screen. But unlike our PCs, we approach our TV sets with a very easy-going attitude. Ask yourself, when was the last time you checked your TV for malware? Do you have antivirus software installed on it? Yet, when you come to think about it, a smart TV is a pretty tempting device to break into. Firstly, smart TVs are not that much different from smart speakers, risks included. Some smart TVs even have voice assistants, such as Alexa, installed in order to help us switch channels, turn down the volume, and search for interesting shows. Cameras are also sometimes part of the deal. That makes them valuable to certain threat actors, such as, for example, the CIA. In May 2017, Wikileaks released one of its biggest info dumps, a huge information laden library of documents. The title was Vault 7 – CIA Hacking Tools Revealed. It included, as the name implies, a collection of hacking techniques used by the intelligence agency. One of the files in Vault 7 described a malware codenamed Weeping Angel. It was apparently developed in collaboration with MI5, the British equivalent of the CIA, starting in 2014, and targets a specific model of smart TVs, Samsung's F-Series. If we take the WikiLeaks dumps at face value, Weeping Angel is a software that mimics a standard TV application such as Netflix. But it doesn't stream reality shows. Instead, Weeping Angel runs in the background and just listens. How does it do it? It turns on the microphone found in the TV's remote and starts recording everything that is said around the TV set. A special feature of this little spy tool is called Fake Off. It's designed to record what is happening nearby the TV set, even when the TV itself is turned off. Weeping Angel is supposedly installed using a USB key, but it may also be possible to install it from afar. In a conversation with Forbes magazine, Matthew Hickey, a security researcher and co-founder of Hacker House, said, quote, The tool appears to be under active development. The capabilities it boasts cannot currently capture video, according to the leaked docs, but that is the goal of the project. It can record audio, but it does not stream it in real time to the CIA. Instead, it copies it off the TV as files. End quote. This means that CIA agents are required to physically approach the infected device in order to extract the information it has accumulated. They do this, according to WikiLeaks Dump, by using a special Wi-Fi hotspot. When the smart TV recognizes this hotspot's name, it transmits the recorded information. We can now imagine a CIA agent in a white van turning off the hotspot in his device and driving into the night. We don't know if the CIA actually used Weeping Angel to spy on its adversaries or if it was just a proof of concept, but it's easy to see why intelligence agencies and similar organizations might find smart TVs interesting. Many, if not most, meeting rooms have TVs sitting in a quiet corner or hanging off the wall. And of course, intelligence agencies are not the only ones interested in gaining access your smart TV. 
It's not immediately obvious why anyone who's not a potential target for an intelligence operation should be at all concerned about hackers breaking into their smart TV. We're used to using our laptop and desktop computers for serious stuff. You know, logging into our bank accounts and such. So it makes sense to keep them safe. But TVs? What reason is there to worry about the security of a device whose main function is to display reruns of Friends and the occasional sports game? It is a valid question, yet it reminds me of conversations I had with people in the 1990s who didn't understand why computer security matters. Why should I care about viruses? I just use my PC to play games and stuff was a common argument back then. Experience has taught us a lot since then, but let's look at some of the current and potential threats against smart TVs. The first virus specifically designed to attack smart TVs was discovered in 2016. Its name, F-Locker, short for Frantic Locker. It started its life a bit earlier as malware targeting mobile devices, but later versions were specifically tailored for smart TVs. F-Locker's developers released thousands of variants adapting the malware to different devices. According to a Trend Micro report, F-Locker spreads via spam SMS or malicious links. Once opened on a smart TV, the malware locks the screen, that is, prevents the user from interacting with the device in any way, and presents a frightening message from the US Cyber Police, a non-existent but scary-sounding agency accusing the TV owner of committing various crimes. It's a well-known scare tactic, but many victims, especially those who are not very tech-savvy, fall for it. F-Locker then demands $200, payable in iTunes gift cards, in exchange for releasing the lock on the screen. Sadly, even paying the $200 gift card ransom does not guarantee the release of the screen, nor retrieval of any stolen information. Who is behind F-Locker? The only clue we have is a mechanism in the malware that checks the location of the attacked TV. If it is located in one of the following countries, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Bulgaria, Georgia, Hungary, Ukraine, Russia, Armenia, or Belarus, the virus stops its malicious attack. This might indicate that the malware authors are Eastern Europeans or Russians, or it might be related to issues of cost versus benefit, or shady matters of territorial division between criminal organizations. Who knows? Less than two years following the discovery of F-Locker, information security researcher Wang Wei from 360 NetLab discovered a new rapidly spreading malware targeting smart TVs, but this time for a different reason. Monero is a decentralized cryptocurrency created in 2014, similar in nature to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, however, Monero places a major emphasis on anonymity, employing various techniques to obfuscate the details of the transactions, such as IP addresses, wallet addresses, and the value of the transaction. These features make Monero especially popular among privacy advocates, as well as with users who have more nefarious intentions, such as paying for drugs and weapons on darknet markets, and naturally, hackers. ADB.Miner, the malware discovered by Wang Wei in 2018, is an example of one such nefarious activity. Like Bitcoin, Monero's transactions are validated by a proof-of-work algorithm, which means that nodes participating in the network constantly work to solve a mathematical problem and are awarded with new coins, a process known as mining. But mining takes a lot of computing power, which can be expensive. ADB.Miner solves this problem by taking over the smart TV and turning it into a mining station. 
And now, it's you who's paying the electricity bill for this little Monero mining operation without even benefiting from it. It's a technique known as crypto jacking, a widespread phenomena in the cryptocurrencies world, and it's particularly common with Monero. There are even JavaScript implementations that turn a browser into a mining station when the user browses a malicious website. ADB.miner allows the attacker to similarly exploit new devices, such as smart TVs, which are potentially less protected than a modern browser, for example. Once a smart TV is hacked this way, the malware continues to scan the local network for other devices. Everything goes. Smartphones, tablets, and of course, other smart TVs. It is a well-known fact that cheap devices are often designed with little security in mind, and this seems to be true not only for knockoff DVD players and $15 webcams, but also for smart TVs. For example, in a blog post released in November 2020, an independent investigator who goes by the name Sick Codes, along with a researcher named John Jackson, warned about serious security holes in Android-based smart TV sets from popular Chinese brand TCL, which controls 14% of smart TV sales in the United States. This translates to literally millions of vulnerable devices. Heck, I have one hanging off the wall behind me right now. The TV in our office is a TCL machine running Android. I guess I'll need to think about what I'm saying next time I'm gossiping about ben O during a coffee break. Are you guys talking about me behind my back again? What? 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 Not, no! Of course not! We were talking about Nate! We were gossiping about Nate! Anyway, Sick Codes and Jackson discovered an undocumented TCP IP port through which an attacker can have full read and write access to all the files in the TV's file system without any need for a username or password. In most cases, an attacker would need to be on the same local network as the TV set, but in at least one case, the researchers were able to access a random TV set in Zambia, Africa, and browse its content until the TV's owner presumably turned off the device. When the two investigators made contact with TCL and reported their findings, an even more troubling event occurred. Sick Code discovered that his TV set was silently updated by the company. In an interview with Security Ledger, he said, quote, This was a totally silent patch. They basically logged into my TV and closed the port. This is a full-on backdoor. If they want to, they could switch the TV on and off. They have full access. End quote. And then they made another troubling discovery. An app installed on the TV called Terminal Manager Remote that was configured so it could send files, logs, and screenshots to servers in China, the Middle East, Africa, and other locations. There's no evidence to show that such data was actually sent and who is the supposed recipient, but the capability was certainly there. Once again, it's not so obvious why we should even care about our smart TVs getting hacked and our data being stolen. And in many cases, the damage might indeed be negligible today. But keep in mind that as the technology evolves, it's probable that smart TVs will take on more and more roles in our daily lives, much the same way that computers and mobile phones became more and more important and useful in the past 20 years or so. Also, it's worth remembering that the bad guys are always looking for ways to exploit these new technologies. Perhaps a hacker could use the TV's camera to gather information about valuables kept in the house and the best time to break into it. Or maybe they could use it to take a sensitive photo with which they could blackmail someone. As TVs become more sophisticated and capable of carrying out more functions other than just displaying sitcoms and reality shows, 
new ways of abusing these capabilities will emerge too. Malicious Life is sponsored by CyberReason. There is nothing better than a live simulation, especially when you're fighting cyber attacks that are becoming more and more complex. Defenders are always looking for the critical edge to reverse the attacker's advantage, and it's only through live attack simulations that you can truly see what might provide you that winning edge. Join Cyber Reason's global attack simulations to watch firsthand how attackers use the latest infiltration methods and execute on sophisticated malicious operations, and more importantly, how to end these operations before they happen. Reserve your spot today at cyberreason.com slash attack sim. TCL's response to sick code's disclosure was roughly what you would expect from a large corporation's PR department. Quote, TCL takes privacy and security very seriously and particularly appreciates the vital role that independent researchers play in the technology ecosystem. We are committed to bringing consumers secure and robust products. End quote. Even if we suppose that the said vulnerabilities were due to bad judgment or bad design, it turns out that this isn't always the case, to say the least. There may even be a bigger problem lurking inside our innocent-looking TVs. One cold day in early December 2019, right between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the FBI's Portland field office issued an unusual announcement. It read, quote, Beyond the risk that your TV manufacturer and app developers may be listening and watching you, that television can also be a gateway for hackers to come into your home. A bad cyber actor may not be able to access your locked down computer directly, but it is possible that your unsecured TV can give him or her an easy way in the back door through your router. End quote. In their statement, the FBI recommended regularly updating the security software on the TV and added a not so technologically savvy tip stick a black tape on the TV's camera. It's a safe bet to say that the FBI's warning didn't really hurt the smart TV sales on Cyber Monday, which came a few days later. After all, it is rather generic and non-specific. Yet, let's take a closer look at the first sentence in the FBI's announcement. Quote, Your TV manufacturer and app developers may be listening and watching you. End quote. The risk that the FBI puts at the top of their message is not about hackers. It's about the smart TV's manufacturers. And it certainly doesn't come out of nowhere. A few months prior to the FBI's warning, the Washington Post published a story about the vast amounts of information that some smart TV manufacturers collect about their users. Big brands like Samsung and LG were mentioned. Collecting users' data is an everyday activity on many devices, websites, and social networks. It's a popular way to improve ads targeting and to tailor relevant content. Yet, gathering information about TV viewers is a particularly sensitive issue. Hacking into a system that controls your coffee machine isn't probably a huge disaster. At most, someone finds out that you're addicted to homemade caramel macchiato. But the information that can be collected by a TV is different. Apart from what can be recorded by the microphone and camera, there's also our viewing habits, which can tell a lot about ours and our kids' interests and hobbies, as well as how much time we spend watching and at what times. This is why watching TV is considered a private activity and is protected by U.S. law. And yet, many companies are not obeying these laws. They collect viewing habits information without getting permission from their viewers to do so, or at least 
without them fully knowing that they've agreed. Collecting information on smart TVs is done through a controversial system called ACR, acronym for Automatic Content Recognition. It is a technology that allows the TV to detect what content is currently being played on the screen without direct access to the app through which the content is streamed. This is done by employing a sort of fingerprinting technique similar to one used by music recognition apps such as Shazam. ACR recognizes on-screen broadcasts via cable, air, streaming services, and even DVD and Blu-ray. But, as already mentioned, watching the viewers is a frowned-upon activity. In February 2017, Vizio, one of the world's largest makers of smart TVs, was accused by the Federal Trade Commission and the New Jersey Attorney General's Office that it had installed an ACR data collection system on its TVs. 11 million televisions in New Jersey collected every detail of their users' viewing habits and passed the information on to Vizio's headquarters without getting clear consent. Vizio agreed to pay $2.2 million in compensation. In a later interview to The Verge, Vizio's CEO, Bill Baxter, defended his company's actions. Quote, So, look, it's not just about data collection. It's about post-purchase monetization of the TV. This is a cutthroat industry. It's a 6% margin industry, right? I mean, you know it's pretty ruthless. And then I need to make money off those TVs. The average lifetime of a Vizio TV is 6.9 years. There are ways to monetize that TV, and data is one. But not only the only one. It's sort of like a business of singles and doubles. It's not home runs, right? You make a little money here, a little money there. You sell some movies, you sell some TV shows, you sell some ads, you know. It's not really that different from the Verge website. End quote. Baxter has a point. What he is really saying is that if it wasn't for the information gathered about our viewing habits and whatnot... These smart TVs would have to be more expensive, and is probably right. It's the same old argument that has been going on for 20 years on the internet. Almost every website we visit, from Google to Facebook to Amazon, collects information about us and our habits, because that's partly what allows us to keep using many of these services for free. If you're not concerned about privacy on the internet, then you probably won't be too concerned about Vizio and other similar companies learning about your viewing habits. If you're the kind of person who cares about privacy, then smart TVs are something to be concerned about. In some ways, smart homes are mirroring the same trends that we saw in the World Wide Web. When computers were first introduced, security wasn't a real concern. As the web became more prolific, that's when we began to see the real risk from malwares and hackers taking form, and at the same time, our privacy began to suffer as more and more websites and services started tracking our activities and collecting more and more data about our habits and interests. Similarly, as our homes are becoming smarter and more connected, the risks from malware and hackers are also getting more serious, and our privacy starts to suffer as well. Is there anything we can do to resist this trend? On a personal level, of course there is. ACR systems on smart TVs can usually be turned off. We can choose not to buy TVs equipped with cameras and microphones, or if we do, cover the camera with a black tape, as the FBI recommended. It's also prudent to change the device's default passwords. This would make it much more difficult for viruses to get in, as they usually try all the passwords and usernames that come from the factory. But if there's anything we've learned from our experience with security on the web, is that all these measures probably won't be enough. 
most users won't bother to change their passwords nor turn off the ACR systems on their smart TVs, which are not always called ACR, which obviously adds even more confusion. Most users will probably continue buying smart speakers, smart coffee machines and smart TVs, as they should. After all, most of us love technology, and we don't want our TVs to be flower pot stupid. This means that unless something very unusual happens, the digital battlefield of cybersecurity will probably expand to cover almost everything around us, from coffee machines to baby monitors. It used to be that a man's home was his castle. It seems that the smarter the castle becomes, the weaker its walls get. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Following the episode about technology bans from a few weeks back, we asked you over on Twitter, should America ban technology coming from Russia and China? The poll's results, in reverse order this time, were the following. 20% of you thought that, yes, we should definitely ban Russian and Chinese tech. 37% say, nah, it can't be done. And a relatively narrow majority, 42%, think we should only ban technologies in extreme and rare cases. So, no big surprises there. Most of you think that in our modern connected world, technology ban is not a particularly good solution for countries who wish to protect themselves. Brendan Lucas from the UK proposed a better solution. Quote, in some cases, it may simply be required. Some networks and systems, one needs to consider the whole supply chain for compromises. And for the West to catch up and overtake in some areas, investing in Western firms is the way to do it. End quote. Fellow Englishman and longtime listener Nick Bowne added, quote, That's very true. Western firms have suffered from a lack of investment and short-term view of making them valuable and selling them off to overseas companies. Business capability is not seen as a national asset in many Western countries. End quote. And refreshingly, a first comment from a Japanese listener, Miduri, an electrical engineer who I think lives in Toronto, Canada. High five electrical engineering, the best profession in the world. And I'm saying that because I'm one, of course. Miduri writes, quote, For the US, the big threat is internal. The Russia-China thing is a misdirect, end quote. And finally, the sixth sense from the city of digital angels, LA, I'm guessing, writes, quote, Cyber attacks come from all over the world. Cyber threats are literally everywhere. Are state-sponsored hackers a reality? Surely. Can we stop them all? Not very likely. I think most of the bad talk concerning China and Russia is almost purely out of spite. End quote. Thank you to all the listeners who voted and commented. If you too wish to be part of the conversation, follow at Malicious Life on Twitter or me at at Ranlevy. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. Our website is malicious.life, where you'll find all of our past episodes with full transcripts. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. This episode's producer was Boaz Lavi, edited by Nate Nelson. Sound design by Benora Bari. Thanks to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh